If you've watched any of my videos, you may already know that I'm a fan of this Ultra. And definitely this Ultra. And I've mentioned this Ultra in many of my reviews because it's one of my daily drivers. Matter of fact, I've never been shy about proclaiming my love for the Note line of phones. So today, you're getting my review of the new S Pen equipped S22 Ultra with some comparisons to its ancestor, the Note 20 Ultra, as well as a cameo or two from its half sister, the Pixel 6 Pro. And of course we had to get Ultra out here with some ultra testing. So you've seen auto framing and great sunlight and great indoor lighting. You've seen all kinds of things, but we're testing things outdoor. Like I said, all about the ultra. So I'm gonna run these tests. I'm gonna let you know how it all comes out and I'm gonna show you some samples. We'll get into all of that after the intro. Let's go. Before we get started, this is a deep dive. So there are plenty of chapter markers below, so you have the option of watching through or skipping around to what's most important to you. And if at any time you're like, damn, this is informative, go ahead and hit that thumbs up and subscribe so I can regale you with gadgetry laden, high quality awesomeness in future vids. So let's begin with the why of this review. As in, why compare a phone from 2020 to one from 2022? I think looking at the upgrade comparison to the Note 20 Ultra is important since most of us probably don't buy the top of the line Note annually. And last year, well, we couldn't even if we wanted to. So what are we getting this year besides the change in camera modules? What's new in 2022? Let's begin with the first thing you'll notice out of the box, the display. This Gorilla Glass Victus Plus Dynamic AMOLED 2 X display measures in at 6.8 inches diagonally. You get the choice to run it at HD+, Full HD+, or it's full 1440p WQHD+, resolution. One day I'm going to have to put up a video rant about the difference in HD versus Full HD, the marketing machine behind those terms. It, it really chaps my height. Moving on. Now, running your Note 20 Ultra at its full resolution, you weren't able to take advantage of that buttery smooth 120 hertz adaptive refresh rate, but this year, not only can you do so, but it's more efficient. Unlike previous year's LTPO displays, this year's LTPO2 panel can scale all the way down from 120 hertz to one hertz. As if the displays on Samsung's panels weren't already some of the brightest you can buy for their outdoor visibility, the brightness has been pumped up from the 1500 max nits the Note 20 Ultra delivered to 1750 nits max brightness on the S22 Ultra. Living in Southern California, for me, screen brightness is much more than a luxury, and Samsung never disappoints in this area. But what do these improvements look like in the real world? With it enabled, I felt like I was being punched in the face with light because I tend to keep my displays set to pretty high brightness and I had to turn the S22 Ultra down and will probably turn the feature off until I really need it. But the display quality improvements definitely shine with content and in a few other areas. To the streams! With both phones display settings matched, Watching The Witcher, the Note 20 Ultra was actually noticeably brighter than the S22 Ultra. Sounds like a win. Nope. When you look closer, you notice that the S22 Ultra has better contrast with deeper blacks, giving it more detail in the shadows. It is a better image overall. Looking at our planet, Coastal Seas, my turtle, by degrees, looks even more majestic, sharper, and more vibrant. It looks even more like I'm diving right there with the cinematographer. And when watching content with a lot of CGI, like Thor Ragnarok, the deeper blacks and better contrast really add a dimension of clarity and richness which improve upon what was already a really solid display in the Note 20 Ultra. But to be clear, I stare at displays a lot. So is this something most people will notice? 
the jury's out on that one, but I can tell you without a doubt that the quality of this newer display is absolutely gorgeous. And it's an improvement and upgrade over our Note 20 Ultras. And of all the displays I looked at in the last year, it is hands down one of the best. And one aspect I don't think gets talked about enough is the stereo speakers on the Note phones. These two support Dolby Atmos and are some of the best on a smartphone, period. And the speakers on the S22 Ultra have actually improved over the Note 20 Ultra. Again, by degrees. And when I first listened to each to compare, I did hear a difference but wasn't too sure, so I broke out the dB meter. Sound separation for both phones is quite good, but volume or perceived loudness for speakers is important. Think of it like a blanket on a cold night. A smaller fleece blanket will keep you warm to a point, but allow some cold air in if you aren't completely blanketed. A larger blanket that wraps around you or goes to the edges of the bed, holds in that warmth and feels better overall. And that's what you get with the S22 Ultra. Using Decibel X, the Doors remastered Riders on the Storm belted out an average 63 decibels and 78.6 decibels max with the Note 20 Ultra. With the S22 Ultra, I saw 70 average and 80.5 decibels max. The S22 Ultra felt more immersive and enveloping like that large blanket as I listened to Art Blakey's Dolby Atmos remaster of Monin. This is the first time I'd say this, but if I'm passively listening to music while I work at my desk, I'd actually have no problem streaming from an S22 Ultra as my source with it sitting right in front of me. And while we're talking Sonics, let's talk about the biggest standout difference in my opinion between these two, the improved ultrasonic fingerprint sensor. Admittedly, the Note 20 Ultra was not my favorite fingerprint scanner of 2020's crop of phones, but the scanner in the S22 Ultra is sublime. It is so responsive and accurate that it is my new favorite. It's literally tap to unlock and you're in every time. It's so good, I'd almost consider upgrading on the strength of that alone. Matter of fact, the only thing that I've actually had an issue with when it comes to the Note's displays are the curved edges. Taking smart select screenshots or annotating toward the edges is quite frankly a pain. Waterfall edges where the images wrap around a bit and pin input don't mix too well. But you know what does mix well? Artificial intelligence, decreased pin input latency and 120 Hertz refresh at the highest resolution. This Ultra has nine milliseconds of latency while the S22 Ultra not only decreases the latency to two milliseconds, but uses artificial intelligence to predict where the S Pen is going next. As you can see in these high speed slow-mo videos. It's about as close as you can get to writing on real paper, coming from someone who isn't using this to create pro level compositions. And of course, you've got your pen tools and air gestures that are requisite parts of having that S Pen onboard included in the kit. Go ahead, you know you wanna turn on the writing sound to complete the fills. Samsung's cameras have been pretty consistent in the last couple years or so, so I'm not gonna deconstruct them, but there are some noteworthy comparisons to make between the Note 20 Ultra and the S22 Ultra, as well as a surprise guest. We're gonna take a look at a few things, among them, the difference in zoom quality, and it is massive. And I, being a man imbued with chocolatey goodness, a so-called person of color, I'm also going to take a brief look at the difference in skin tone rendering with the Pixel 6 Pro's real tone cameras. First those zooms though, the Note 20 Ultra's 12 megapixel 120 millimeter 5X optical periscope telephoto <sighs> only went up to 50X, while the S22 Ultra's 10 megapixel 230 millimeter 10X optical does 100X. That's the difference between this moonshot and this one. Or these crane shots at 1x, then 10x, then 30x, then 50x. And here's the 100x, which the Note 20 Ultra doesn't have. But you can see in the 50x shots that Samsung has definitely stepped their zoom game up. With their newer device, you're getting a fourth camera. It has 
two telephoto lenses as opposed to one, and a 10x optical instead of 5x optical zoom, in addition to a 3x optical zoom on that fourth camera. You're also getting the ability to take better macro or close-up shots. Here's the Note 20 Ultra, Pixel 6 Pro, and S22 Ultra. The latter has the best shot here to me, thanks in part to the S22's focus enhancer feature, which I used with the main lens. There's definitely greater clarity in the details and textures in its shot. And here's another. This time, a look at Sony's super small link buds. The S22 beats the 20 in the shot, though it's quite close. The 22 is a bit sharper and let in more light, but what about when there is no light? Google's night shot mode is often regarded as one of the top night modes, and in my previous years of testing, Samsung's always held its own with Google in this area. Today, it surpasses it in my grandpa statue test. I take this photo almost every year in relative darkness, almost complete darkness. Both images have their pros and cons, but you get more detail, better color rendering, and better contrast in Samsung's photo this year. You'll also get some artifacts, which you don't see with the Pixel 6 Pro, but overall, for this extreme dark test, I think the S22 Ultra's image is the better of the two. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And if you've watched other reviews, you've seen auto framing probably at this point. Was it following me? Yes. Yeah. But here I am trying it out at night when it might not work so well because of dark faces. And being someone with a darker skin tone at night in relative darkness, I thought it might struggle, but as you can see, it clearly had no problem keeping up with my movement. I and my crew were all highly impressed with it actually. And here are some nightography shots. Wide shots of that bus stop area and the S22 Ultra shots have brighter exposures without dramatically increasing grain. They are also sharper and when you crop in, the background details like this sign are much sharper than the Note 20 Ultra's capture. And let's talk skin tones and real tone briefly. Took these shots with one of my son's buds and I will say that though both shots look great, real tone does make a difference here. My son on the left has more red in his skin, which matches the red in his buddy's skin. But the Pixel 6 Pro produces images with more yellow and green color tints in my son's skin while keeping his buddy with the redder flesh tone. The Real Tone Camera AI did a better job capturing what my son's skin tone actually looks like. And what about video? These 4K 30 videos tell the tale. Again, the ability to capture more light wins. And this year, all four cameras are capable of capturing video at 4K 60. For this video edit though, these are 4K 30. With that said, there is a clear difference in quality, as you can see in this low light setting, as I switch lenses between the ultra wide main 3X optical telephoto and 10X optical telephoto. Final note here on the video, the main sensor is capable of up to 8K video capture at 24 frames per second, like the Note 20 Ultra. Something Samsung talked about this year is how improved their portrait mode's edge detection is. And I'm the perfect test subject, beard. Frankly, it was darn good, though it didn't capture and cut out all of my beard hairs like it purports to be able to do. It did pretty much the same job I'd do by hand using Photoshop. It smoothed out the beard edges, clipping some hairs to give me a smooth silhouette. Though in some photos, it did appear to cut them all out. They also say that their portrait mode is better with pets, and I do have to say that with this camera, I clearly have the best looking dog on the planet because this photo is majestic AF. And I will say that capturing fast moving subjects with this shutter can be an exercise in first world problems patience as we wait and worry about missing those action shots, but I think that a lot of reviews I've seen forget about burst mode. Once activated, simply slide the shutter button down or to the right or to the left, depending on how you hold the phone, and you'll wind up with anywhere from a dozen or less to a hundred photos to choose from. That's the cat. Now, in my testing with dogs, burst mode was okay, but I wonder if you'd get better results if you're a parent and it's human faces you're catching, maybe baby's first steps, or the kids at a little league game, or you're off to the ballpark for a day and get close enough to uh, the players to get good photos of the action. 
So I need a little more testing to see just how effective it is or isn't in this latest iteration. But TLDR, using the shutter button in the standard mode of fraction photos is not the best way to capture action. Use burst mode. One last note on the camera, Samsung has a lot of fun tools in their camera, like director's view, and some highly functional AI tools, like the aforementioned focus enhancer, but you also now get the new Expert Raw app. You can download that from the Galaxy Store. It allows you to capture multi-frame raw files. Multi-frame raw files retain more data than the raw images captured directly from the stock Samsung camera app. Then you, from there, can open up Lightroom and tweak the photos, or you can go third party, but this has a hook right in there for, for Lightroom. Lightroom is a limited time trial, so you may want to cop another raw image editing app. I don't know how many folks would be using this, but if you're shooting something for a school or work project and really want to make that project sing, this is definitely a great option to have. Now, let's talk some nuts and bolts experiences I've had using this phone so far. Battery life. Mine has been really good so far. I really haven't found myself worrying about emptying this 5,000 milliamp hour battery. I've been able to get five hours screen on time from 12 a.m. to 3 p.m. the next day, approximately 15 hours. And if I really need to top up expeditiously, the S22 Ultra now supports 45 watt fast charging. And I have a 100 watt total output charger on my desktop, 45 watt anchored dual port car charger on the center console of the whip, and keep a dual port 65 watt charger at the day job. I'm probably one of the few people who disagrees with most other reviewers who go on and on about having to buy a new phone charger with each phone. You don't. And it actually does save waste when you buy your own high wattage charger with multiple ports that you can use for multiple devices and use for years in most cases and just use that for your phones. Many manufacturers don't place the matching high wattage charger on the box anyway when they do include a charger and the prices quite honestly aren't bad. There are some companies making some great charging solutions at really good price points so buy a high wattage GAN and good cables, one for home, one for office or car if that's your gig, and you'll be good to go for at least two or three generations of devices, maybe longer. And I'm noticing that the ecosystem grows ever more ecosystemy. Uh, I notice more and more connectivity hooks on my phone. I've been using it connected to my Galaxy Watch 4 Classic. And last night, I had my watch in power saving mode after it had been on the charger for a while. My phone had a status message in the notifications, which said that the watch was fully charged and asked if I wanted to turn off power saving mode. Then when I tapped the drop down arrow, the option was right there on my phone to turn it off. One thing I wish Google would fix with Android though is the consistency of their bit perfect audio output since so many flagships and pro models eschew the three and a half millimeter audio jack which would actually be a pro level feature, but we won't go there for this video. The S22 Ultra should support 32 bit, 384 kilohertz audio output. But when I connect my Toppings D10S, as usual, Android down samples to CD quality. Why won't you let my FLAC files live? If you want bit perfection, you're gonna have to go third party with an app like USB Audio Player Pro. That's what I use to bypass Android's limitation and get that flat goodness in its full glory. S22 Ultra plus THX Onyx plus Campfire Audio Mammoth IEMs equals... Yeah! Something else to yell for joy about is that Samsung is promising four years of OS updates, so you should be good up to Android 16 since this launches with Android 12. That's longer support than you're going to get from the maker of Android's operating system, Google. Not bad. The model I'm reviewing has 12 gigabytes of RAM. The Note 20 Ultra started at 12 gigabytes of RAM for their base model. One big difference here will be that the Note 20 Ultra does have expandable storage. With the S22 Ultra, you start at 128 gigabytes and go all the way up to one terabyte with the 256 gigabyte and up options, getting you 12 gigabytes of RAM, as opposed to the eight gigabytes that comes with the base 128 gigabyte model. And how was gaming with this power hungry, hothead of a processor Qualcomm's Snapdragon 8 Gen 1? I'm not an esports icon. 
Hell, I'm not even an esports water boy, but an hour of gaming via Xbox Game Pass playing Streets of Rage 4. Saw a 10 to 12 degree rise in temps according to my heat gun and was hotter near the camera module than it was at the end closer to the USB-C port. Now, I was gaming with the Razer Kishi, so I wasn't holding the phone in my hands directly so that heat was the result of the load on the chipset along with 5G streaming supporting my gaming. I did switch to Wi-Fi though because my 5G connection was a bit choppy. And to close this near half hour special, I'm gonna leave in the comments below some things I think you may be asking about this video. The Galaxy Watch 4 Classic Case Band Combo is something I found on Amazon if you want that ultra beefy G-Shock look. I love bespoke icons, but I prefer One UI over third-party launchers, so I use the Viral Icons Pack, which doesn't work with One UI, but with Adapt Icons, you can create shortcut icons to launch apps, then use Viral's icon set for your shortcuts. And my lock screen is made possible by the good folks at Good Lock. Using that, I've modified my status bar, the layout arrangement, and added more shortcuts to my lock screen. I'll leave links to all those things in the description. Hey, are you still watching? If you are, thank you. If you have any questions that I didn't answer in the video, leave those in the comments below and I'll do my best to get to as many as possible. We don't take it lightly that you stuck around for this ultra review of an ultra device compared against some other ultras. I hope you have an ultra day or night and I'll catch you on the next video. Yeah!